It's been 84 years and 312 months. What is there to say about the Titanic that hasn't been said already? My mother came to this realisation when she went to the Southampton Museum in 2018 and considered writing a book about it. She's Catherine Arnold of Pandemic 1918 fame. Writing about death and scandal is kind of her thing. But even she had to admit that there is so much that has been said about the Titanic that it is a true feat to try and find a new spin to put on the poor ship and the 2200 souls aboard. Hundreds, if not thousands of ships have sunk and have their own terrible stories about loss of life. The Titanic lost a sister and a competitor in the First World War. When the Costa Concordia happened in 2012, parallels with the Titanic were inevitable. And then there's the Wilhelm Gustloff, filled nearly 10 times its capacity when it was sunk on January 1945, killing at least 80% of the passengers. But the Titanic is the ship we think of first when it comes to man-made disasters. Time and again, it's been the backdrop of so many stories that if all those fictional characters we have come up with were actually on that ship at the same time, the ship would be filled to capacity. I guess a new spin on the Titanic is giving an in-depth look into the history of the Titanic, followed by ranking and analysing why we keep bringing this story back to life. What is it about the sinking of one ship 110 years ago that has such an impact on us? The rankings will be a mixed bag to say the least. When I started this channel, I had thought it would just give me an excuse to make fun of bad camera work and painfully miscast actors with a side order of critiquing bad writing. I didn't know I would have to talk about the rapping dog. For those of you who don't know, there's going to be a rapping dog and it's going to be so painful. But first, let's look at the history of the vessel so you'll know what I'm talking about when I get pissed off. This is the part where we talk about the capitalism. There's no agenda, it's just that the system's been present since the 18th century and has far-reaching consequences, but the moral of the story is capitalism sucks. Anyway, the Industrial Revolution changed many things for many people. For the working class of Europe, life was endless days of sweat and toil in dirty factories. What a terrible work. There's no help or safety. Economical and religious factors made the idea of emigrating to the United States a reasonable escape route for a simpler life. Catholics and Jews would face much less prejudice in a country that asserted religious freedom. And when you're living in a cramped London slum with the sky blotted out with black smoke, you just begin to dream of a country with more space. Some industries moved their companies overseas to the colonies for cheap labour, which left workers at home no choice but to move abroad to find work there. Crossing the Atlantic Ocean has always been considered a dangerous venture. Before commercial ocean liners, ships weren't very luxurious unless you had the money to pay for a private cabin. Even then, the weather could make a crossing uncomfortable or deadly. Because of the danger of the crossing, it was common for male providers of the family to go over to America first and then send for the rest of the family once settled. Throughout the 19th century, things gradually began to improve. The White Star Line and Cunard were two British commercial shipping companies and gigantic rivals until they would form a merger during the Great Depression. While they were the primary companies for simple transportation between America and Europe before airlines came along, the main profit and purpose was to transport immigrants to America. By the end of the 1900s, Cunard were best known for their ships, specifically the Mauritania, Aquitania and Lusitania, being the fastest to cross the Atlantic. They were considered the greyhounds of the seas. The Mauritania held the Blue Riband for her speed between 1909 and 1929. Meanwhile, the White Star Line was more focused on the luxury of their vessels. A new fleet was to be designed by the White Star Line. The aim? To create the largest, most luxurious ships in all of history. The Olympic-class fleet was to be a trio of White Star Line ships designed by the Irish shipbuilding company Holland & Wolfe in Belfast. While they would not beat Cunard in terms of speed, they would surpass them in terms of extravagance. Before this fleet, the White Star Line were famous for their Big Four fleet, named the Cedric, K2, 
Celtic, Baltic and Adriatic. Three out of the four ships lived long careers and were scrapped during the 1930s, while the Celtic ran aground near Queenstown and had to be slowly dismantled over five years. The president of the White Star Line, J. Bruce Ismay, commissioned the director of Holland and Wolf Shipyards to design and build three of the largest ships that would ever be built. They would be designed by Thomas Andrews and Alexander Carlyle, and they would be called the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Gigantic. But then someone must have looked at the third one and said, oh, what a dull name, and they changed it to Britannic instead. Olympic was to be the first ship. It began construction in December 1908, with the Titanic being built alongside it from March 1909. The RMS Olympic would be the only ship out of the three to have an illustrious career, ending with being scrapped in the 1930s. Her initial construction was completed in October 1910, and she was launched on the 20th of that month. This was basically where she is released from the slipway where her hull was constructed, before being towed to a dry dock so the shipbuilders can add the interior. The launch of the Olympic was a widely celebrated event, where she was filmed backing out of the slipway. She had been painted light grey for this exact occasion, where she could easily stand out on film and photographs. She was then painted black after moving to dry dock. Her maiden voyage was 14th of June 1911. It was similar to the Titanic's in that it left from Southampton, called at Cherbourg and Queenstown, and then sailed west for New York City, arriving on the 21st of June. The captain for the voyage was none other than Captain Edward J. Smith. Thomas Andrews and Bruce Ismay were also passengers. Olympic was so popular following the success of her maiden voyage that she received over 8,000 visitors in New York and 10,000 spectators for her departure. In September 1911, the Olympic collided with a British warship, the HMS Hawk, which rammed into the starboard side of the Olympic by accident while they were travelling parallel between the Isle of Wight and the English coast. Fortunately, there were no casualties. During World War I, the Olympic was recruited by the Navy to ferry munitions and troops across the Atlantic. She gained the nickname Old Reliable for surviving so many missions. At one point, she split a German U-boat in half. In 1935, she was eventually scrapped at Jarrow on the northeast coast of England. She had travelled 1.8 million miles, completed 257 trips across the Atlantic, and transported 430,000 passengers. Parts of the Olympic are still viewable today. Some of her fittings were auctioned off, including wooden panelling from the first class dining rooms and the grand staircase, the latter of which can be found at Southampton's Sea City Museum. The Titanic's younger sister, the HMHS Britannic, sadly did not get the chance to become a luxury passenger liner. After the sinking of the Titanic, construction on both surviving sisters were radically changed to fit better safety precautions to avoid another incident. The Britannic was sitting in dry dock when the First World War started, and the Navy were claiming as many ships as possible to serve in protecting Britain. The Britannic was quickly remodelled into a hospital ship to carry injured troops home, entering service on the 23rd of November 1915. She served for barely a year when she was struck by a mine in the Aegean Sea, trying to reach the island of Lemnos to pick up injured soldiers. She sank rapidly as her captain was trying to beach the ship, but it allowed the flooding to become more rapid. The main casualties that came from her sinking were the result of crew members releasing lifeboats without authorisation while the ship was still moving. They were sucked into the ship's repellers as they rose from the water, killing anyone in the boat who didn't jump out in time. She sank in just under an hour. Captain Charles Bartlett was one of the last to leave the ship by simply walking off the bridge into the water and swimming to the nearest lifeboat. Construction of the Titanic began on Queen's Island in Belfast Harbour. As she was designed to be larger than any ship ever built before now, alongside the Olympic, Harland and Wolfe had to demolish three slipways just to make room for the two new ones. The beginning of the ship's construction is better known as her keel being laid down, as that is where the ship always begins from and the workers build upwards from there. This began on 31st of March 1909. Because the Titanic and the Olympic were built side by side, they were practically identical, with their frames designed to be floating box girders. The keel was the backbone of the ship, with the frames of the hull acting as ribs. To support such a powerful weight, both ships were fitted out with a double bottom, as a reinforcement, which would help prevent the risk of the bottom of the ship leaking in case it was damaged. This was also where the ships would hold their fresh water supply. The hull of the ship was made from steel plates. They would be nearly 2 metres wide and 9 metres long. 
Because welding was not a common practice in this time, the method of keeping the ship watertight was to overlap or clinker these sheets together and then have them held in place by rivets. About three million rivets held the Titanic together. These days, it is faster and more productive to use hydraulic rivet guns, which are much more reliable. The lads down at Harland and Wolf mostly had to stick to a method where the rivet is heated up before being placed between the two sheets and one person on either side hits the head of the rivet with a hammer until it is flattened and cooled. It was discovered in the 1990s, after the wreck was discovered and investigated, that the steel plates to build the ship would become incredibly brittle in cold temperatures, which is a likely factor in the disaster. This was not known during the time of the construction, however, and this kind of steel is not used in the making of ships today. The Titanic was fitted with three engines. For each engine, there was a propeller to drive the ship. The two driving the port and starboard propellers were reciprocating four-cylinder, triple expansion steam engines, and the one driving the central propeller was a Parsons turbine. By combining the engines with the turbine, this allowed the Olympic-class liners good speed with a combined 34,000 kilowatts, and prevented uncomfortable vibrations throughout the ship, but the amount of steam power would not be lost. Cunard had this problem on the Lusitania and Mauritania. All of Titanic's engines were powered using steam, a process in which burning coal boils water to keep a turbine going. Rather than expel the steam out, it could be reused by condensing the steam. The Titanic carried over 6,700 tonnes of coal. 600 tonnes were burned every day, all of which had to be shoveled into the furnaces by hand in the bowels of the ship. Over 100 tonnes of ash had to be dumped into the sea every day. And we wonder why climate change is going to kill us all. Smoke would be exhausted from three of the Titanic's four funnels. The fourth was not actually a functioning funnel, as it was instead simply a dummy placed for aesthetic purposes. I will mention the lifeboats and Scotland Road when we get to the sinking. Every time you watch a Titanic movie, someone has to say that this ship is unsinkable, which kind of makes it their fault for tempting fate. But it is true that the Titanic was claimed to be an unsinkable ship. This is because the ship was divided into 16 compartments, each divided with 15 steel bulkheads that went up to E-deck. If a collision happened, she could stay afloat with any four compartments flooded. Of course, we know that when the ship hit the iceberg, five compartments were breached, meaning that the water would keep spilling in and go over the bulkheads. After the sinking, it was decided that all bulkheads had to reach the top decks. Titanic was also unique in that she would have a 24-7 Marconi wireless service situated near the bridge of the ship. Most ships had Marconi wireless, but they only had one operator. By having two, the ship could allow passengers to send wireless messages. This wireless service would be an absolute necessity for saving the lives of Titanic's survivors. Overall, the ship was fitted to accommodate 2,435 passengers as well as nearly 900 crew members, making an average capacity of 3,437. First-class passengers would be granted many amenities. These included a French cafe, an a la carte restaurant, a gymnasium, a swimming pool, and a Turkish bath which had an extra charge. The idea was to present the accommodation on Titanic as a floating hotel and feel as little like being on a ship as possible. Some cabins on B-deck had private promenade decks and lounges. Second-class accommodations had similar high-quality furnishings, including mahogany bed frames, though some cabin assignments would put single travellers in the same cabin. Bathroom facilities were shared, while some first-class cabins had ensuite facilities. Public second-class amenities included a library and a barber shop. The majority of passengers on the Titanic were steerage or third-class, only paying for a one-way trip. As such, they were granted the least amount of space, but the accommodations were a lot better than on most ships. To prevent unruly behaviour below decks, men travelling alone would have their cabins in the bow, and women and children travelling without a husband or father would stay in the stern, with a filter of family cabins in the middle. The public areas involved a dining room, a smoking room and a general common room. Lavatory facilities and steerage had the only toilets that flushed automatically, mainly because third-class passengers were coming from lives that might not have had proper plumbing. Before individual accommodations for passengers, sleeping quarters were a free-for-all, with men, women and children sleeping, eating and passing the day in the same space. Early ocean liners were not obliged to supply food for steerage, so fights would break out over the food the passengers brought with them. The White Star Line provided three meals a day to passengers, which was another new experience for some steerage. Washing and cleaning facilities were limited by today's standards. 
Even in the first class, some cabins would have to share washing facilities, unless they paid more for a cabin with an ensuite. There were only two bathtubs for the whole of steerage. Keep in mind, in working class households, they were used to only washing once a week in a tin bath that they all had to take turns using. To save on fresh water supplies, all baths were filled with seawater, and there was no official laundry service on the Titanic. Facilities to iron and press clothes for first class passengers were available, however. So, every time you see a Titanic movie, and they use the laundry room as a plot point, it is a strong indicator as to what little research was done. Another factor is when they put jewel thieves lockpicking their way into first class cabins to steal diamond tiaras. First off, passengers didn't have their own cabin keys, but stewards did have skeleton keys to lock all cabins that weren't used. The next issue being Passengers obviously would not leave their jewellery in an unlocked cabin. They would instead have their jewellery kept in the purse's safe. If anyone did bring a personal safe with them, specifics haven't been released. Eight shipyard workers died during Titanic's construction. The first was a 15-year-old catchboy named Sam Scott, who fractured his skull after falling off a ladder and died instantly. Most shipyard deaths were caused by falls, as this was before we had general protection equipment, which would inspect scaffolding at all times and provide workers with lanyards and harnesses. The Titanic was launched from her slipway on the 31st of May 1911. The launching was filmed, but the footage hasn't survived. Contrary to popular belief, the ship was not christened with a bottle of champagne. Her completion was delayed by several weeks because of the Olympics collision with the Hawk. It wasn't until the 2nd of April that the Titanic was put through her sea trials. The sea trials were a series of tests that runs the ship at several speeds and how it goes by doing an emergency stop. This is how the ship is considered seaworthy. An hour after passing the sea trials with flying colours, the Titanic departed Belfast for the last time to go to Southampton for her maiden voyage, arriving on the 4th of April. It had taken a little over three years to build Titanic from the ground up, but she was finally ready to sail across the Atlantic to America for the first time. The first of what would be many voyages. The ship would be filled with more than initially thought because of the coal strike of 1912. This was a 37 day long strike that started in Alfreton, Derbyshire and caused severe delays in shipping and train schedules. This led to a lot of vessels cancelling their routes and transferring their passengers and coal supplies to the Titanic so she could have her maiden voyage in time. All the stars had lined up to put the Titanic in the path of that iceberg. Had there been one day's delay, then perhaps that iceberg would never have drifted in her path. Personally, I see the number of coincidences that led to the Titanic sinking as an inevitability waiting to happen. The standards of health and safety which we adhere to so devoutly these days are partly there because of the Titanic. If she hadn't sank in 1912, it would only have been a matter of time before another ship suffered a similar fate. Perhaps the Lusitania would be the ship we wouldn't stop talking about. The universe is chaotic, but nothing is without consequences. The 20th century was when we really started to see the value of human life, and realising people are more than just cogs in a machine to become statistics. In 1914, people cheered for war and imperialism. Today you don't see ordinary people cheering for war as much, because of the collective empathy towards those who will suffer. Sometimes it takes something completely unpredicted and unprecedented to happen, before we as a whole realise the defects in a seemingly flawless system. No system is perfect, but by taking the correct precautions, we can protect as many people as possible. Hey guys, thanks for watching the first of many Titanic videos to come over March and April and possibly May as well. It's gonna be a lot of videos, mainly because I'm splitting bigger projects into smaller parts that I can handle because I'm gonna be working a lot more outside of doing YouTube videos, but I still want to fight against the algorithm. So the next video to come after this will be a short coverage on what happened during the maiden voyage of Titanic, right up until she struck the iceberg, and then following that a video about the details of the sinking. I was going to do another part between this and the maiden voyage, which was about famous people who were on the Titanic at the time, but when I was writing that script it got so much longer than I thought it would, so I'm making that its own video and it's going to be called 50 Famous Faces of Titanic. I had to set myself a limit at 50, so if there are people on there you want to see but aren't on there, then I, I'm sorry, but remember, 2,200 people, I can't cover all of them. 
Yeah, and I'm glad I finished this video today because I got an email today. I've been asked to go into work next month and do some dresser work backstage and of course dresser work does take a long time and it's going to be it's from the 12th to the 16th so all of a sudden I'm quite glad I'm doing these in smaller parts because if I was going to make three videos for a deadline and then suddenly find myself taken away from that it's just like nah let's not do that anyway if you like this video please make sure to hit that like button and if you haven't subscribed to me already please make sure you press that subscribe button and ring the bell and if you want to help support the channel as well, you can become a patron, like these lovely people who have been so great in supporting the channel. Especially to my King and Queen patrons, Anastasia Gracia, Alison Cuff and Larissa. You guys are great. The history video should be done by the end of March, apart from the 50 Famous Faces. I don't know when I'm going to get that done, so I'll just write the scripts for the ranking videos alongside them, work on them alongside them, and we'll see what happens. 